Okay, everybody, on this um, part of this week, we're going to talk about the presidency and some of the president's responsibilities and maybe some of the characteristics that I, ex uh, you know, I asked you guys to kind of come up and, and think about what characteristics you think the president should have. And we'll talk a little bit about those. We're going to talk about approval ratings. We'll talk about executive orders. We'll talk about War Powers Act. In a separate video, we're going to have a, a recording about the contemporary presidents. That's going to be from lbj all the way up until obama um i intentionally left trump off not that i don't like him which i kind of don't uh but uh, just because i don't think it'd be fair to judge him without having a full four-year presidency under his belt um so all the other presidents that we have have either had um you know four-year terms or eight-year terms uh so i didn't think it was fair to to not give trump a full term so i didn't include include him into the contemporary president okay let's get to it let's talk a little bit about um the president okay so one thing that we judge the president by is by their approval ratings you know um and we hear this all the time about the approval ratings all presidents, except for Trump, kind of begin their terms with broad public support. But over time, that support declines unless a new crisis or a dramatic action is taken. Um, it can also, uh, you know, be affected by military actions. And this is both positively and negatively. Recessions, um, obviously, negatively. Scandals, negatively. And, and crisis, which could be positive. Um, you know, and we'll talk about Bush uh, uh, W., in a little bit and how 9-11 actually improved his approval rating to a record high so if we take a look at these links here these are the president's approval ratings right this is a traditional trend of the president's approval ratings and if you look at this website you're gonna see how um, uh, the average approval rating each president has had since Harry Truman. And you know what? Any They can range anywhere from a, from a 45% all the way up to 70% that JFK had. But then again, JFK only had a two-term presidency. Um, Nixon, 49. Ford, 47. A Carter, 45. Reagan, H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, W. and Obama. If you go to the next one, these are the first year averages um for those of them for those of the presidents they had two two terms uh here is the second term averages um this is their high as we can see um you know uh, if you look at w george w bush september 2001 which i can remember like it was yesterday a lot of you might not be able to but i can um uh, 90 percent approval rating obama was at 69 uh, Clinton, 73, George H.W. Bush, 89, and you can see again, February 1991 was the first Persian Gulf War. Uh, Carter, 75, Reagan, I skipped Reagan, 68, uh, Nixon, 67. So you can see just off of this, the American people are kind of fickle, right? Uh, here's the lowest, um, Remember how Bush had a 90% when, uh, you know, October of 2008, which was the presidential uh, election season, uh, he was already going to term out, but he had a 25% approval rating. And if you think about what are some of the reasons, we had two wars in the Middle East, and we also had a housing market that crashed, and our economy was in disarray. So, obviously... Uh, when we talked about retrospective voting, this was one of the things that I was trying to point out that actually helped Obama in his election. Um, 25%. Uh, August 2011, October 2011 for Obama. I'm not quite sure um, when that, what, what the significance of that was. It might have been. Um, uh, some of the Obamacare arguments and some of the, the things that were coming out of, of the Obamacare decisions that uh, happened. I may be wrong, but I'm willing to guess without, you know, trying to look. Um, that is what it is. And if you see the trend lines here, you know, there there's different trend lines between each president. Uh, Nixon at his low point, this was at his, the point of his resignation was right above 20%.
And then we see W. No, not, that's HW. This was here another recession that we had uh, from 91 to 92, kind of that, that, that tr down uh, trend. Uh, Clinton, you know, and one interesting thing about Clinton, look at um, 1998. Uh, this was the height of the Lewinsky scandal. So if you look at it, his approval rating jumps up right around the time he was impeached, which tells you one thing is that maybe that that impeachment wasn't a big deal to the American people. You look at George W. Bush, here's the spike, and then we see the downward trend, uh, an uptick, downward trend, uptick, and then steady go, steady downward trend until right above, uh, you know, at the end of his presidency. And here's Obama. Okay, so that's an important thing to take a look. We hear about approval ratings all the time. That's where they come from. Uh, the president is also the celebrity in chief. Um they have instant name recognition throughout the world, instant face recognition, and so on. Fred Greenstein in the book details, um, you know, five functions that we believe a president should have. Um, if we look at uh, the, the the third one, the third point, I think this is the most important thing that a president needs to do. Um, it's a symbol of unity and of nationhood. Um, this talks a little bit about, uh, you know, what happens if a president passes. I also kind of like to extend that uh, to what happens if there's a national tragedy. We kind of look to the president to guide us. And if you look at any of the great speeches that the presidents have given, whether it's Reagan talking to us, uh, 1985, the Challenger uh, exploded, uh, the space shuttle exploded. Reagan comes on TV, gives a very poignant speech, uh, talks about how everything's going to be all right, and kind of you know, kind of uh, 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 kind of calms the American people's grief a bit, or their calms their fears. Um, George W. Bush is uh, uh, speech on the night of 9/11 from the Oval Office was really very well done. You know, kind of coming out and, and showing that everything is going to be okay. Uh, I always think one of uh, Obama's best speeches is the Sandy Hook speech. Where he not only was a president that day, he spoke about the children that passed in that horrific shooting. And he also kind of came across as a father, right? So, yeah. So, we see that. Also, they need to, you know, kind of be a symbol of social stability, you know, I mean, I've never really seen a president who has been uh, looked on upon so negatively as Trump. A lot of it is his own doing. A lot of it is that he prods the, the media and he baits the media and they, they take it hook, line, and sinker. But, yeah, I mean, one of the problems with Trump is that he kind of panders a little bit too much to the right. A president is supposed to be a uniter, not a divider, and I think that's what Trump does sometimes. Um, and we talked about the one of the president's most powerful things that they need to do is the power to persuade, the power to persuade the American people, the power to persuade, persuade Congress. Uh, you know, trying to get people to do something they normally wouldn't want to do, right? In the past, and we talked about this during the media section, the news media has protected the president by not reporting on his private moral conduct. That thing is out the window now, right? President is also the chief executive of the nation's largest bureaucracy. So we have the executive branch. And remember, the executive branch kind of operates like a business, right? The president would technically be the CEO. And all the departments under him, whether it's the Department of Justice, the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture, they kind of all act as a part of the president's business. They handle day-to-day -day operations of the, of the government, um, and the president's in charge of all of them. Uh, obviously, the president can be constrained by se the Senate as part of his appointment powers. Uh, the president can appoint, but the Senate has to confirm. Uh, Congress determine the budgets of departments. Um, executive orders are something that a president can do where they issue 
you know, something that has the force of law, but it's a directive to the executive branch, right? So one of the last executive orders that Trump has done was trying to protect those monuments that every, uh, people have been destroying. Um, he's made a directive, I guess, I, I would figure it'd be by, to the Department of Justice to start enforcing uh, laws with regards to people vandalizing and tearing down statues. So that, that's an example of an executive order. Now remember, as you guys know, with your separation of powers uh, knowledge, is that this could be checked by the U.S. Supreme Court. They can determine whether or not his executive order is constitutional or not. That whole concept of judicial review. The president is also chief legislator. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the president can sponsor a bill in Congress. But they can definitely be in people's ears. So the Constitution requires presidents to recommend to their Congress consideration such measures that he shall, he shall judge necessary and expedient. So I want you to remember that the president can't necessarily sponsor a bill in Congress, but he can get a congressman to sponsor a bill in Congress. And, you know, you have kind of the, 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 the. You know, and for lack of a better term, this is the only term coming to my mind. Uh, the lap dogs that he has, kind of like the Matt Gertz, the Devin Nunes, those type of, of people that are willing to do anything that he, he wants and, uh, you know, refrain from criticizing him. Uh, he could be in their ear to kind of have a bill generated and then presented to Congress. Also gives State of the Union addresses. Now, the State of the Union address is cost constitutionally recommended not mandated so each year the president gives the state of the union address which is where he details what his plans are for that year usually happens in january addresses a joint session of congress uh along with the supreme court um and his cabinet everybody's there but one person they send one person back uh they keep one person in a secured location usually a member of the cabinet uh, that's in case something tragic happens to the Capitol building. There's a Kiefer Sutherland television show called Designated Survivor where he was Secretary of the Treasury and the, all Congress got wiped out um, and the President and Vice President were killed. Uh, so he was the next in line in the secession order and he became President that way. Uh, he has the power of the veto, which we talked about, and signing statements, which are, you know, where he gives reasons about signing a bill or vetoing a bill. So also chief diplomat uh, formulates U.S. policy, has the power to make treaties with foreign nations, appoint ambassadors and other public ministers, councils, receive ambassadors and other public ministers, and is responsible for the use of military force. Uh, the president is obviously commander in chief of the armed forces, but Congress has the power to declare war. One thing that came out of Vietnam or, or kind of was... Uh, as a result, uh, was the Wars Powers Act of 1973. What this does is the Wars Powers Resolution requires the president to notify Congress within 48 hours if he sends armed forces to military action. And those armed forces can't be within that military action with, with for more than 60 days. If it goes past 60 days, then Congress needs to give authorization for the use of military force or a declaration of war all right so we haven't declared war since world war ii korea vietnam some of the actions that happened in the 80s the first persian gulf war uh the second persian gulf war the war in afghanistan those were all done with congressional approval uh i'm not quite sure if there is something uh, that you know, as far you know, kind of use an example of, of Obama uh, giving a directive to send the Navy SEALs to go in and get Osama bin Laden. Um, I don't know where that falls in with the War Powers Act if he has to notify Congress um, or do some type of, of uh, notification to maybe the leaders in Congress, um, but that might be a point for another for a more constitutional scholar to be able to uh, be able to dictate uh the president is also chief of law enforcement and granter of pardons so what is a pardon a pardon is basically a get out of free jail card right uh 
you know, uh, pardons are used at the federal level and at the state level. Governors can also pardon. Probably one of the, you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr., who had a lot of problems when, in the 90s, um, you know, got went through rehab, got some jail time, got his rights taken away, uh, reformed himself, became Iron Man. And a couple of years ago, Jerry Brown, who was governor at the time, uh, pardoned his crimes, so he got his right to vote back. Um, you know, the president... Trump has done that as well. Trump has pardoned uh, an assortment of people that have kind of been controversial. One is Joe Arpaio, who was a sheriff in Maricopa County who was uh, uh, tried and convicted of ignoring a federal order regarding some of his actions regarding you know illegal immigrants. Uh, he was set to be sentenced, but Trump pardoned him. Now, the president is not necessarily the former party leader. It's not part of his formal duties, though he is recognized as the party leader. What does the vice president do? Not much. Uh, it's historically a limited role, though it began to expand with Mondale, who was, uh, who, uh, you know, took on a bigger role in, in the Carter presidency. Um, Rick, Richard Cheney, or Dick Cheney, also had a huge role in formulating policy. And if you ever watch the movie Vice, it really details some of that. Let's have White House lobbying. So they have legislative liaisons that, you know, contact people who are members of Congress and contact their staff. Uh, they track them through committee and floor proceedings. They count votes and they cut deals and so on. And, and this last point I'm not even going to go over because you guys probably know that. Uh, the veto power, as we know uh, through talking about checks and balances, uh, most powerful weapon in dealing with Congress. However, that veto can be overridden. There's been some some instances of whether or not the president should be given the line item veto. And what the line item veto says is that um, you can, a pre as a president, you can strike out portions of a law instead of having to veto the whole law so you could veto portions of the law but not necessarily the whole law um so say you have you know items a b c and d but the president doesn't like d he can veto d but let a b and c go through uh that's been declared to be unconstitutional it's a violation of the president clause of the constitution basically that says the federal legislature um federal legislative procedures by which bill originates in congress become federal law in the u.s and that the president doesn't really have a right to do that. Also can issue with the pocket veto. Uh, a pocket veto is where the president uh, grants, uh, the Constitution grants the president 10 days to review a law passed by Congress. If the president doesn't sign it after 10 days, it becomes law. If Congress adjourns before that 10 day period is up, the bill doesn't become law. So just remember that. So when we talk about presidential power, there's usually two schools of thought, right? Uh, there's a constructionist view, or at times this might be called an originalist view, or a stewardship view. A constructionist view is where the president cannot exercise any power which is not specifically granted by the Constitution. On the other side, we have the stewardship view, where it says the president has the right and obligation to do anything needed unless specifically forbidden by Congress. And at times, the presidents have done unconstitutional things to preserve our democracy. And we'll talk about that when we get to civil rights. The president also has executive privilege, where they can keep confidential communications from other branches of government. Nixon used this. Uh, you'll learn about this when, when we look at the Nixon portion and how Nixon uh, had tapes made in the Oval Office of his conversations because he was really paranoid. And um, there was a time where he didn't want to turn in those tapes to Congress be, or to a special investigator because he considered executive privilege. Now, we talked about impeachment as well. Congress holds impeachment powers over the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States. talked about the president one of the key things is the president has absolute immunity from civil suits arising out of the execution of official duties so basically what this tells you is 
that if the president is within the description of their powers or in with kind of within the the core or what the constitution states about their powers and if they're executing one of those powers they can't be sued for that now if he does something outside of those powers he might be able to uh, might be uh facing a civil lawsuit like say for instance of of a president sexually harasses somebody that's outside the scope of their official duties and they might be sued civilly for that here's a, a, a little portrait of the executive branch and you can see all of the the cabinets in the middle and all of the departments that are underneath it and the president acts as the ceo of that branch and he talks a little bit about the cabinets. Okay, let's just go ahead and go over California really quickly. Um, you know, the governor is the head of government. Currently, that's Gavin Newsom. Develop policies, much like the president. We have a lieutenant governor who kind of acts like the vice president. But unlike the vice president, the governor and the lieutenant governor do not run together. They can be as separate parties. They're separately elected positions. The Attorney General, who uh, is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer here in California. We also have an Attorney General at the federal level. That's Bill Barr right now. Secretary of State. We have a Secretary of State on the federal level. Controller, deals with money, treasurer, insurance commissioner, superintendent of public education. Okay, so that's what we got for the executive branch. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about in the next video is presidents from LG, LBJ, uh, not LeBron James, Lyndon Baines Johnson, all the way up into Barack Obama. Okay, have a good evening.